do the usual introduction. Uh, I'll start from the second speaker, if you don't mind. And uh, today we have, uh, right now we have a session with two speakers, so we're slightly looser on time. Uh, we have uh, one hour and 15 minutes. And um, so today we have uh, Professor Joseph Harrington and Brendan Lussier with us. Uh, Professor Joseph Harrington has made seminal contributions to antitrust and competition policy, including a lot of practical work on collusion and cartels. Uh, developing methods for detecting collusion and methods to deter it and uh, informing the competition authorities throughout the world on how to do that. Uh, at the same time, uh, Brandon Lucier works in uh, a very exciting theoretical area of uh, algorithmic mechanism design and algorithmic game theory. Uh, it has the same goal of designing uh, a good allocation mechanism for a group of self-interested people, but it has this uh, additional toolbox of computer science tools, right, like optimization and uh, and similar, but also which comes at the cost, uh, obviously, of um, having to care about computational interoperability, unlike uh, we do in like in regular mechanism design. Uh, so uh, I started in this order to uh, go ahead, uh, go straight to your talk. So whenever you're ready, you can share the screen. Fantastic. All right, uh, can we see this? Yes, yeah. okay, fantastic. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the very kind introduction and also for the, um, for the invitation. Um, I, I think this is, it's a fantastic topic and a fantastic area for just interdisciplinary work. And so I'm, I'm really excited to sort of see all the different um, perspectives here. Um, as, as Arthur mentioned, my, my um, background is in um, you know, economics and computation, in particular um, from sort of the theory perspective. Um, so this is going to be a, a largely theoretical talk. Um, and, and the thing I'm going to be focusing on is um, robustness um, to complexity in sort of buyer preferences and behavior, um, and in particular with an emphasis on um, complex preferences around spending money. Um, and so starting point to sort of like high level motivation is around sort of the, the impact of increases in scale of sort of automated platforms, okay? And so this, this complexity around spending money sort of becomes more relevant as, you know, automated pricing systems become a larger part of an individual buyer's life, right? So I wanna think about, you know, of an individual person who's spending more and more of their overall like daily expenditures through Amazon, say, um, which I don't know about you, is sort of, you know, uh, the last year in particular really describes sort of what's happening for me. Um, but we can also think about this on a, on a business level, right? So you can imagine, you know, an individual business spending, you know, money on digital advertising um, and sort of increasingly, you know, most sort of expenditures happening even in like small businesses is going into, you know, digital ad spending, um, which is sort of funneling into like a small number of um, individual platforms like Google and Facebook. Um, and so what's sort of happening here is not just that the, you know, these automated platforms are sort of large in scale, but that, you know, from an individual buyers or an individual customer's perspective, um, it can be that a non-trivial fraction of their total spend is sort of under the influence of a particular pricing engine, right? And this has a lot of interesting implications, um, one of which is that, um, that, you, uh, that the, from the platform's perspective, um, the, the, uh, the, um, the attitudes of a buyer around spending money, things like their budget constraints, their risk attitudes, how much they wanna have in the bank, um, you know, the way that they're splitting money across different channels um, can actually sort of manifest in the behavior that the platform observes from an individual customers. And what that means is that um, you can uh, come into situations where sort of these local approximations of customer utility, right, the effect, you know, like how they respond when I sort of tweak the price of an individual product um, doesn't necessarily paint the whole picture of how they'll behave sort of in aggregate over large amounts of spend. Um, and in particular, um, the non-linearities in people's attitudes around spending money might start actually coming in and affecting behavior in a non-trivial way. And so the question we want to get after is, um, how is it that sort of these, you know, potentially unknown and complex and non-linear preferences around spending money, um, how do they affect consumer behavior? Um, and does this, is this something we need to worry about when actually coming up with um, pricing technology? Um, and so it's just a, just a foreshadow, what we're going to find is that certainly um, when you have sort of nonlinearities in people's preference for money, um, this affects behavior, but it affects behavior in a very structured way, as it turns out. Um, and this lets us argue about things like, even if we have um, systems that are completely agnostic to the way that customers are thinking about, say, budget constraints and other such things, 
um, we can bound you know, the, the impact on efficiency or revenue um, that would come out of that as long as we're sufficiently careful about um, thinking about incentives sort of internally in these systems. Um, good, so this work is, is as I said, um, a theory work. It's based on um, this paper with a fantastic set of co-authors, um, my colleagues Moshe and Nicole at Microsoft Research and also Richard Cole from NYU and Jason Hartline at Northwestern. Um, and this was really sort of diving into this impact of nonlinearities. And um, so to, just to pin down ideas, so the intro to this point was pretty abstract, I wanna focus specifically on an application which was our starting point, which was digital advertising. Okay, so I'm sure, you know, in this, in this workshop, sort of everyone's sort of uh, very familiar, um, but I wanna, you know, very specifically think about things like sponsored search, right? This is a motivating application. So user comes in, they, they make a, a query for something like watches, a bunch of advertisements get shown of various sizes and formats. Um, and these are all priced algorithmically. So the, um, the price that advertisers pay to show these ads is sort of determined by some automated auction that's run internally in the system, okay? Um, and the, the rules for this auction, you know, vary by product offered, but um, I want to abstract away from the specific rules and said, think about like, what does this look like from the advertiser's perspective, right? So from an advertiser's perspective, the, they have some advertising campaign, they would go in through some bidding interface that looks like this. Um, it has lots of different knobs and, and adjustments that you can make. Um, but the things that I want to particularly emphasize is that, you know, for, as an advertiser, I would plug in a bid, which is, you know, what's my you know, willingness to pay in order to get say a click or a conversion or an impression or something like this. And then I can also specify a, a budget constraint, which say limits the total amount that I would spend on this platform over some period of time, like say a day. Um, and basically this all gets put into input to some internal automated uh, auction system, which then spits out um, outcomes. And at first glance, the fact that this is sort of running as an auction internally feels like it's, it's quite different than just say like an, an algorithmic pricing system that sets a menu. Um, but I'd argue that from the uh, advertiser's perspective, it's actually not so different um, because the incentives aren't binding at the level of an individual auction, right? So from an advertiser's perspective, sort of what they see is they set a bunch of campaign parameters and then they get feedback of the form, you know, okay, over a period of time, here's how much you paid and here's how much value you get in terms of say something like um, number of clicks or something like this. But I'm gonna abstract away from the specifics, okay? And as I, adjust my, my parameters of my campaign, either manually or using tools that the platform provides or some third-party optimizer, it sort of maps out some space of what outcomes I could possibly get, which maps out some, you know, Pareto frontier. Um, like, you know, here's how much I would have to pay to get a certain, you know, amount of value, um, you know, clicks or impressions or whatnot. Um, and we can think of this frontier as basically just defining a price schedule. And so as long as, you know, the platform is exposing sufficient tools, a, a platform, an advertiser can basically pick what they'd like off of this off of this menu that they're effectively getting implicitly. And so the thing that we're, we're really wanna go after here is how should we model the behavior of the advertiser who's gonna ultimately pick um, where they wanna live on this on this curve. And as a, you know, a first approximation, it, it might be reasonable to say, okay, well, what they're going to do is they're gonna look at um, picking a point that maximizes their value minus spend. Right, so like, you know, I can pick up, here's my value, here's my, here's my cost, maximize, you know, take a quasi-linear model, maximize value minus spend. Um, and if, if we're talking about like small stakes spend, that's a reasonable approximation, but it sort of leaves out an important part of the, of the overall uh, system, um, which is that this platform is not necessarily a monopolist, right? Um, there's gonna be outside option values for spending money. And so from the advertiser's perspective, Right. Oftentimes what will happen is they'll have some you know, amount of some sort of operating budget that they've set aside for advertising. And they're choosing to send some of it on this channel and some of it on some other channel. Um, and you know, from the you know, perspective of say Bing, it would be sort of silly to try to model advertiser behavior without taking into account the fact that Google exists. Um, but you know, also from the perspective of something like Google, you know, clearly advertiser behavior is gonna be affected by the fact that they're splitting between say digital advertising and print um, and other such things. And so I'd say sort of universally, this idea that we're, we're sort of splitting across different channels is a first order concern. And the fact that these things are not linear is important when the spend is large enough that these sort of non-linearities actually affect behavior, right? And so if advertisers are actually optimizing this way, then from the perspective of our platform, from the perspective of sort of the red platform here, what they're going to observe is that, you know, the advertiser is gonna start sort of putting money into their system. And certainly they're pulling that money from the least valuable uses of money first. 
And so effectively what we're seeing is just a nonlinear cost to spending money, right? There's some you know, nonlinear disutility curve. And what the advertiser is doing is they're maximizing you know, value minus the disutility of spending money, which is not necessarily linear, right? And the thing I want to emphasize is that the nature of this curve is potentially very complicated. It encodes um, budgets, it encodes all of the possible options that are beyond the scope of this particular platform. Um, and so what we'd like to do is we'd like to be robust to the form of this curve and not necessarily try to actually learn what it is, okay? Um, and so that's the game. And so the, this, is all, this is all just sort of setting up this model, which was to um, consider how we should set up um, a payment system for something like online advertisements, given that we have these convex disutilities for spending money, which we don't necessarily know, all right? Um, and you know, a lot of the theory in this sort of assumes linearity and when you know, scales are small, you get these linear approximations, but these are not necessarily going to be good um, approximations to behavior in sort of large stakes spend. Um, okay, and so what we're going to do is we're gonna think about like how much does this actually affect consumer behavior, right? How will people actually behave given that they have these nonlinear values for money? Um, and to sort of set up that question, we're going to imagine that we as a platform are completely agnostic to the form of these curves, other than the fact that they're convex. And I want to compare that to the very lit rich literature that's out there on actually looking at different forms of attitudes towards spending money and designing systems sort of tailored to them, right? So you can imagine, you know, if I think people are risk, risk averse in a particular form, what should I do? Um, if I think there's ROI constraints and, and various other such things. Um, what we're going to do instead is say, let's imagine that we're ignoring the effect of the, the fact these things exist. What are customers going to do in response? Um, and so informally, what we show is that um, let's imagine, again, like as I said, we're just going to be agnostic to these cost of money curves. Let's suppose we run some auction. And so again, I'm going to frame this in terms of this online advertisement. So we have this auction running underneath. Suppose we designed it with quasi-linear bidders in mind, assuming that people had linear value for money. And we deploy it in a scenario where people don't have linear value for money. It turns out something interesting happens, um, which is that in a very general setup, what we would expect is that customers actually behave as though they are quasi-linear, but they'll scale their values down by a constant factor, right? And so in general, we could imagine that people would behave in, in sort of interesting and sort of funny ways. Um, that are not consistent with quasi-linearity. But in fact, what happens is people will behave as, as they're, though they're quasi-linear, but with value scaled down, as though their value for them is lower than it actually is. And that scaling factor is, um, is a knob, like it's a strategic knob that they're turning, and it is interpretable. It's actually the return on investment that they're going to get um, at the equilibrium of behavior. Um, and so then, okay, that's interesting. Um, it actually turns out there can be multiple equilibria of this, of this strategic behavior. And so we, we care about things like, is this going to hurt efficiency? Is this going to hurt revenue? Um, and so specifically um, motivated by this setting of digital advertising, we look at a case, a special case where we're selling multiple items and the values are additively separable. Um, and what we find is that in fact, this does not hurt welfare too much in terms of like efficiency, right? So there can be multiple outcomes. Um, so the results can be ambiguous. Um, and those results can, those, those outcomes can have different efficiency. Um, but with respect to a, you know, a, a natural notion of welfare for this, you know, not fully transferable utility model, um, there's an approximation result, which is that no matter which equilibrium we choose, we, we're always sort of within a factor two um, of any other, right? Um, and there's a similar result here for revenue, uh, which because of time, I'm not gonna be able to go into too much. Um, but again, if, as long as we're sorting our reserve prices appropriately, um, the impact of you know, these strategic behavior on the part of the, the consumers, um, given their nonlinear value for money is limited. Okay, um, so that was sort of the high level. Uh, I wanna basically illustrate this with an example. And this is a toy example. Um, and I'm signaling it's a toy example by uh, having it be fruit, but you can think of this as like, I'm different have advertisers um, bidding on keywords. And so I wanna imagine a situation where I have two different advertisers, pink and purple, um, and there's two different things that they're bidding on. And you know, pink values the banana twice as much as the apple, and purple values the apple twice as much as the banana. Um, now, if people had linear value for money, if, if people were quasi-linear in their preferences, then the theory is pretty clear on what we should do under the hood. Um, if, for example, we were targeting a maximizing efficiency, we'd run like VCG auction or something like this, right? We would say run second price auction on each good, um, 
agents would report their values truthfully. Uh, I get the efficient outcome. Everything's great. But now I want to imagine what would happen if instead of doing that, we plugged in, uh, instead of having linear value for money, we plugged in a non-linearity, right? Where the advertisers say have some soft budget where they're happy to spend up to say 50 cents on our platform. But once they start, once they spend more than 50 cents, it becomes more painful for them to spend money, okay? So that they have basically one unit of disutility for do per dollar up to 50 cents. And then after that, they have four units of dis uh, disutility per dollar after that point. What happens then? Um, well, and, and again, we're gonna, we're gonna say, we didn't know this was true. So we decided, oh, we're gonna run the, the BCG auction. Um, well, so first easy observation is that no, we no longer should expect to have this like nice incentive property that people wanna report truthfully to our auction. Okay, so in particular, if these two bidders sort of reported truthfully, we run our second price auctions, um, highest bid wins, so great, we get the efficient outcome, um, except each one of them is sort of paying the second highest bid, right? So in particular, purple wins the apple, they pay one. Um, but if we look up in our curve, how much disutility you suffer by paying $1, um, it's something like two and a half, right? Which means they're getting negative utility um, by bidding, okay? so. The, what they'd be incentivized to do in response to this is bid less aggressively, right? So they, in response, they'd want to sort of scale their bids down so they're paying less. Um, and so the, the, the sort of the result is uh, in terms of the structural characterization is that there's always an optimal way for me to bid in which I preserve the fact that say, I like the apple twice as much as the banana. I just sort of you know, apply a scalar to that um, representation. Okay, and so we could actually like plot this out in terms of um, what would happen in terms of the what scalars the agents would choose for this example. Um, I'm sure just showing here the sort of the the best response dynamics um, on like what what would be the the force pushing us towards lowering or increasing our scaling factors. Um, and it turns out here there are exactly three equilibria, right? So there's an efficient equilibrium, which is this one um, in the middle, where the agent sort of both sort of scale down by a uniform factor, um, and then we get the efficient outcome. But there are other equilibria as well, right? So you can get outcomes where um, one agent bids more aggressively, which effectively generates higher prices for the other bidder, which causes them to bid less aggressively, um, which, which ultimately results in lower prices for the first one. And so you can get an equilibrium in which they're sort of balancing each other this way. And so what's effectively happening here is the agents are you know, choosing points on this Pareto frontier by using this, this multiplier, which they use as a, uh, that which they can tune. Okay, so again, this is, this is the, 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 the characterization result just sort of stated more formally, which basically says that for every bidder's perspective, no matter what everyone else is doing, there's always a way for me to respond in which I behave as though I'm quasi-linear, but I apply some factor to my, to my values that I'm basically revealing to the platform. Um, and this is all framed in terms of direct revelation mechanisms, but you can think of this in terms of like indirect things as well. Um, basically, agents will behave in a way that's consistent with quasi-linearity, just with their values scaled, and they're strategically choosing what that scaling would look like. Um, good. Um, and so the thing I want to point out in terms of this application to, um, to ad auctions is that, remember, the, the interface exposed this sort of extra parameter, which was this budget constraint, right? Which at first glance, you might think of as like a primitive of, of my preferences as an advertiser. Like, oh, I have an advertising budget. I should put my advertising budget in there. Um, but the way this is actually used internally in these systems is that if I put in a budget and my budget constraint binds, um, then typically what will happen is there'll be a, like a pacing algorithm internally, which will say, I'm gonna take your bids. And if I think you're gonna go over budget, I'll scale them down so that you sort of hit your budget target exactly over the time period in which it, it, it's supposed to bind, okay? And so this, is a, this is a feature, like it's a, it's a sort of a bidding agent that, that is provided by the platform, um, which you know, a rate is sort of sold as saying like, oh, you'd like to spend your budget you know, evenly over the day and we'll sort of help you do that. What this theory shows is that actually, not only is it about spending over the day, it's actually aligned with sort of a richer set of preferences in which I don't actually have necessarily a hard budget. I just have some general you know, nonlinear feature of spending money. And I want to target, you know, I want to use this as a knob to choose sort of an optimal point on this curve. Then the fact that we implement this budget by scaling the, the bids um, is precisely aligned with what the advertisers would want to do anyway, if they could sort of optimize um, in sort of a strategic way. 
right? So I want to, it's important to think of these sort of these budgets, um, these things that we're exposing the interface, not as primitives of the preferences, but as a tunable knob. Um, and what's sort of interesting is that even though these, this part of the preferences that we're agnostic to is, um, is very highly dimensional, sort of the effect on behavior is actually through this very single dimensional um, uh, thing that an advertiser can tune. Um, good. So uh, as I mentioned before, there, there can be multiple equilibria and so we worry about like what are actually the impacts on things like efficiency and revenue. Um, so I just very briefly mention that if we come up with a reasonable measure of you know, how much welfare is generated by an outcome, um, we actually get a reasonable a, a robustness result, which says we actually don't lose too much um, by not being fully aware of these cost curves. Um, and so the metric here is going to be something, something that we call transferable welfare, um, which is to say, given a particular outcome, I'm going to measure how much would be the maximum amount that the advertiser would be willing to pay to sort of obtain that outcome. And, and this is something we can read off from their, uh, from their uh, convex disutility curves. Okay, so remember their value for money is not necessarily linear, and so I can't measure their value in dollars. But I could say something like, if I want to understand, you know, how much would you be willing to pay to get, say, this outcome, I can read that off from the curve, and I could say basically this is like a maximum amount that you would have been willing to pay. And so we could add this up over all advertisers. This is some, basically what this is measuring is something like how much would society pay in dollars to implement, you know, our mechanism, like our pricing platform. Um, this generalizes the standard notion of welfare for quasi-linear bidders and sort of and, and other things for specific um, utility models, um, but sort of goes into uh, uh, it applies to sort of these more general um, disutility curves, and the result is basically an approximation, a constant approximation result. All right, so it's a very you know theory theory style result, which is to say that um, in the worst case, over everyone's preferences um, and over any equilibrium selection um, issues, if they're multiple equilibria, we're guaranteed to always get at least half of the best possible transferable welfare over any outcome. Okay, and so the way I wanna think about this is not so much that you know half of the best is, is a good thing, but rather that you know if I look at there be different equilibria and maybe some are good or some are bad, um, the gap between good and bad equilibria can't, is not gonna be catastrophic. Um, and so this you know gives us a sense that it would make sense to then go in and do a more empirical style analysis of particular preferences um, to get a sense of like what this constant factor actually is in cases we really care about. Um, good. Okay, so I'm out of time. Uh, so let me just sum up. Um, basically, what I want to argue here is that in reality, people's preferences for spending money is not linear. Um, a lot of the theory um, in you know the way that we say set up and tune um, um, you know bidding platforms and things like this sort of makes a local approximation that people's preferences for money are relatively linear. Um, but sort of as spend increases. The, the sort of behavioral effects of these nonlinearities can become more pronounced and it's something we should take, take into account. Um, and this can actually affect behavior, especially if we have mechanisms that are agnostic to this, these effects. Um, but the nature of that effect is actually pretty structured. Um, and this can actually, you know, if we expose the right things in our interface, like for example, um, bidding agents um, in, the, in this case of digital advertising, um, we can sort of align uh, the advertisers, you know, uh, strategic uh, responses to these nonlinearities in a way that makes it easy for them to participate um, and actually leads us towards something that looks like an equilibrium outcome where we can bound the impact on things like efficiency and, and revenue um, of these nonlinearities. Um, and so I guess what I want to leave off with is that this, this analysis of the impact was very, in this case, very tailored to this ad hoc and settings is where I started. But something I'm very curious about is sort of what this says about more general environments as well. Um, where you know it's maybe less natural to run an actual direct revelation auction underneath, um, but rather you have say like pricing systems and recommender engines and things like this as well. You would still uh, you would still expect that agents will behave as though they're quasi linear, um, but the the strategic effects of them scaling their values might manifest in different ways. Um, okay, and with that, I will close. Uh, thank you.